Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are lucky to have uh, Senator Mushahid Hussain with us. Uh, he does not need any introduction, but for this program, you all know that he is the chair of the uh, Senate's Defense Committee. He is also a member of uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and he has been our Minister of Information. Uh, more than that, he is an intellectual par excellence and a very sought after. Uh, expert on foreign affairs. We have learned from him and I have been uh, lucky that I worked with him when he was my editor in The Muslim and I was correspondent at Quetta. Uh, and our association goes back to well, almost four decades. Sir, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, with me, we have uh, Im Ambassador Imran Yawar. We are all batchmates. Yeah, thank and you. thank you so much uh, for uh, gracing the Ambassador's Lounge. Uh, this program is focused on challenges to Pakistan's external affairs, Pakistan's foreign policy, especially when you look at the domestic scene and then our economic condition. Uh, what is your overall view about the emerging situation and scenario for Pakistan? First of all, I want to thank uh, Excellencies, both of you, uh, for uh, honoring me with this invitation at Ambassador's Lounge. This is a very good initiative. And I think uh, the people who see this program will learn, hopefully, because we are talking to experts and specialists who have served in the field. And I want to wish uh, all your viewers a very happy new year. Thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting time in Pakistan and in the region. And I was struck by a statement made uh, last year, which still resonates and I think that probably, in my view, was the most important statement by, made by any leader. It was President Macron of France. And he said in his address to the French ambassadors, you are ambassadors exactly, in Pakistan, exactly, exactly, exactly. that uh, yes, so this that's is the, uh, the era of Western yes. hegemony is coming to an, an end, end after 300 years. Exactly. Correct. And I think that is the hallmark of what is happening in the world. The shift in the global balance of economic and political power away from the west to the east. And we are in the center of gravity in terms of the location, Correct. in terms of the role where there is turbulence and there is transformation. Can we survive in these turbulence times? Yes, we can. Right. I think Pakistan has survived through a lot of difficulties. The one thing which defines the Pakistani nation, in my view, is resilience. We survived 71 Correct. when our country was dismembered under, uh, because of our own mistakes and because of uh, uh, foreign interference. But we bounced back and we built the bomb after that. Unfortunately, we have a nation which is tough, grit and resilience, but our leadership at times is weak. What do you think, Imran? Yeah, sir, you are right. The leadership is weak and uh, leadership does matter. Uh, I mean, last tenure of, of uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan, I think he did less to make friends and made more force. Now, that has really impacted our foreign policy. Unfortunately, uh, we our foreign policy is something which is a very specialized field. And all our top leaders would want to be their own foreign ministers. And mm. you become your own foreign minister through either tweeting or through statements, okay. although foreign policy is a very specialized field. Right. And I think uh, if we speak less and do more and have, as you said rightly, I totally agree with you, uh, Ambassador Imran, that uh, we should add to our friends rather than adding to our foes. <laughs> so now, sir, are we in a state of isolation? No, we are not. The look, our role, first of all, Pakistan matters in terms of size, in terms of history, in terms of our location and our role. The only nuclear country Correct. among the Muslim countries, located at a region which is the center of geopolitics in the world and also the center of geoeconomics at the same time. Correct. You have Central Asia, China, Russia, South Asia, Gulf region and Iran and Afghanistan. So, Senator, what you are saying is our importance is only because of uh, our nuclear capability. One aspect of it. And also our location and our role and also our history which we have had. But, but we, we haven't have uh, taken benefit from yes. our geography. Unfortunately, we have had a very 
tactical worldview at times because that suits us uh, for the tactical purposes that maybe the rulers feel that this will be a plus for us. We don't take the long view. That is, I would say, a strategic view. Why? The, the question is and why? You have been in the government, right? Asif's question, why? I think when I was in the government and I was the chief spokesman of Pakistan, I must say with pride that it was our finest hour when we detonated the nuclear bomb and resisting external pressures. When there were five phone calls from Clinton, there were five billion dollars offered, the whole world was, uh, and they said Pakistan cannot do it, we did that. And I think that was one of the finest hours that it was done okay. so smoothly, seamlessly. So that was the correct strategic decision. And Indians also mellowed down because earlier Advani has said, now we'll bring Pakistan to its Your knees. knees. <laughs> you know that statement, statement you mentioned, I was traveling with Mr. Nawaz Sharif, the Prime Minister then in a car. And he said, uh, what's the news? Uh, have you seen the statement of Advani? It was, I think, 19th of May, uh, uh, 1990. I still remember. And at, for the first time, Advani linked the Indian nuclear bomb with the Kashmir issue. And he said, Pakistan should now change its attitude towards India on right. the Kashmir. So Correct. it was almost like a threat. Correct. And uh, I said, sir, yes. Uh, he said, it's so arrogant the way he speaks. I said, sir, it will last only a week or so because we had already taken the decision to test. Correct. And that came on 28th. So I think that was a correct decision. Our decision with China was a correct decision. I think the founding fathers, the first phase of Pakistan's foreign policy was pretty good. 50s and 60s. And I'll go back to the founding father, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. His first interview after the creation of Pakistan to a foreign journalist was to Life magazine, a lady called Margaret Brock White. And it's in uh, Internet, 5th of January 1948, cover story of the Qaid. Right. And she asked the Qaid, this is about October, November 1947, what is Pakistan's role? What is Pakistan's future? And mind you, at that time, we were facing war with India. Our assets were held by the Indians. There was hardly a bureaucracy, hardly a foreign office or a military or a other civil bureaucracy. Influx of refugees, exodus of people. And he said, Pakistan, and I quote, is the pivot of the world placed on the frontier where the future geopolitics revolves. And I think that it's has been quite prophetic. Yes. Last 50 years, you start with the Cold War, good or bad, <laughs> Pakistan's role has been pivotal. Uh, opening to China, the bridge between Washington and the, uh, the last big battle of the 20th century which ended the Cold War, Afghanistan, the first big battle of the 21st century, the uh, war on terror. We have been playing that role. And when it comes to our core interests, I think we have managed to protect But that. don't you think that we were a second uh, fiddle in this whole scenario? And uh, we in fact uh, relied more on the United States. So we we played whatever they wanted to say and then it was a transaction relationship and once the job was over they left us and uh, for that our leadership in fact rather than in fact promoting a strong regional policy they only went as you rightly pointed out they were only tactical in their approach i would say that uh, we also uh, uh, extracted what we could for us for example the afghan war I was one of the critics, as you know, in right. those days. And I went to even uh, interview Dr. Najibullah in Kabul right. yeah. because I disagreed with uh, their foreign policy on Afghan policy and said this will lead to a culture of Kalashnikovs. We are putting all our eggs in the American basket. But the Afghan war gave us the cover, the opportunity to build the bomb. But at what cost? The question is, y yes, at the we social level. We misread the brutal. whole thing. Yeah. My view then was, and I told this to the leadership at that time, that Americans' interest is only to take revenge for Vietnam. Correct. And we thought the Americans will help us in the liberation of <laughs> Afghanistan, <laughs> Islamic Republic, liberation of uh, Soviet Central Asia. That was not their game. Yeah. So we misread the tea leaves. That is, but we managed to build the nuclear program and that framework. So that was one uh, singular benefit of nuclear that. Nuclear program, yes. Now, our policy on Afghanistan, look what it has brought us to. I mean, there is we are in a, in, a, in a situation where there is terrorism going on and it is linked to uh, Afghanistan and our so-called friends, they, I mean, they, don't, they have not turned out to be our friends. I was always a critic of our 
Afghan policy in a so-called strategic depth approach. And in those days of the General Zia regime also, are, we made the same mistake which other foreign invaders made. The Brits, the Russians, the Americans. We took Afghanistan for granted. We thought it's an extension of our influence and we'll put the, our people in place. And I was saying always, whether it's the Afghan Taliban or Karzai who is, who is or making, General Mujib. Who is making, General the, Mujib. making the policy as far as Afghanistan is concerned? That is it the foreign by, office? No, it started with Mr. Bhutto. 1976, 75 rather, Mr. Bhutto started this policy and he encouraged the first uh, Mujahideen leaders to come here as a tit for tat for the Pashtunistan policy of Daud. Right. And Hikmat Shah, Rabani, Abdur Rab, Rasul Sayaf and Ahmad Shah Masood came into Pakistan. Yeah. And I was told by uh, General Nasirullah Babar, my yeah. friend later on, that only uh, three people knew about this policy, Mr. Bhutto, General Tikka Khan, the army chief, and General Nasir al -Babar. And said, what about Mr. Agha Shahi, the mm -hmm. Secretary General of Foreign Affairs? He said, we didn't want him to be involved in it because then he can speak with authority. He doesn't have to lie on this issue, whether That's we are 20, involved. The year 2023 is here. The, most of the policy was made by the military establishment. There's no doubt. Sir, foreign policy is the forte, is the job of the foreign office. I'll give you an example. I was information minister. Mr. Pri uh, Nawaz Chief was the Prime Minister and uh, in May 1997 uh, the Khabar Nama on PTV announced that Pakistan has recognized the Taliban. Yes. And uh, Mr. Nawaz Chief called me after 5-10 minutes. At that time PTV was the only show in town. He said, Mushayat Sahib, who gave this news? I said, the, uh, the Foreign Office gave it to us. And he said, I don't know about it. How can we, how have we have not recognized the Taliban? I said, ask Mr. Ghoriyub and, <laughs> and when the, they checked for Mr. Ghoriyub, he said, the ISI told me. Oh so, so that's how we, unfortunately. So sometimes the roles are abdicated. But I would also say there have been strong foreign ministers and I appreciate at least three of them. Sir Zafrullah Khan in the 50s, who yes. did a great job. Mm. Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in the 60s uh, and also early 70s. And then Mr. Agha Shai, who was a brilliant officer. And don't forget one thing, the biggest geopolitical opening after World War II, the uh, rapprochement between Washington and Beijing was done by three people, two from the foreign office, General Yahya Khan, Foreign Secretary Sultan Mahmud Khan, and Agha Hilali Saab, the elder brother of Agha Shai Saab. Mm -hmm. No ISI, no forge, no intelligence, so they did it. So that shows the diplomatic feat of so these is, professional uh, diplomats. Is it a failure of our political bosses because they could not in fact confront on the security establishment and whatever they wanted to say they could have it and then our political bosses they in fact they said okay yes. I would say overall the buck stops at the president or prime minister Correct. and the civilian leadership and I would agree with you unfortunately at times but on issues they have taken positions like Mr. Bhutto he took initiatives and he overruled the military people. Then see what happened to him. Yes, but that happened for other reasons, for domestic reasons, mm -hmm. not for foreign policy reasons. And uh, secondly, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, when the nuclear tests were taking place, let me tell you very clearly, mm -hmm. there was no pressure from the military establishment to test. There were three service chiefs. One said, one opposed it, one supported it, and one said, sir, you decide the political leadership. And the political leadership took the decision. So I think when you have the will or the vision, you can take those decisions. But I agree with you, when the political bosses abdicate, say on India policy or on Afghan policy or under the policies, then the result is often a disaster. And the Afghan policy is frankly a disaster. And uh, how do you see it uh, unfolding in uh, 2023? I also have one reservation about, uh, at one time we became the spokesman of the Exactly. Uh, and we were saying we were almost uh, advocating the case and now suddenly we are saying we'll have hot pursuit or we'll do this and that. I don't think this language is, uh, behoves Pakistan to deal with a small and poor country. And I was also surprised by some statements that we need American help on security, border security with Afghanistan. Is Afghanistan a superpower? Are we confronting a new Cold War? 
we have a mashallah large army of 600,000 and plus another half a million paramilitary and uh, we have uh, missiles and nuclear weapons. We can take on that uh, so terrorist militarily we are okay. Yes. But it is the economy in fact which uh, would be a biggest challenge for Pakistan and what is happening right now you know it better. Uh, Ambassador Saab, I beg to differ more than the economy the political polarization is the number one problem You're which right. is uh, now that's destabilizing. Me, yes. That's yes. That's uh, frankly more than the economy. You absolutely are right. Correct. That is the core. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, uh, because of the political bickering and tensions yes. economy is it's suffering. It's an unending quest for power where you are fighting with a zero-sum uh, a mindset that one side has to win, one side has to lose. That's not how democracies function. And the parliament is not functioning. Unfortunately. The parliament is not And I call it political room. tribalism because Correct. we have just resorted to our basics. And we should be very honest in saying that. I've been telling my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, we need a political ceasefire on certain issues. Sir, on two issues, India and China. China with respect to CPAC. What, how do you see the future? And with regard to India, is there any hope that there will be some kind of uh, ice breaking? India also, we had a uh, lack of strategic clarity. We have lacked strategic clarity on the issue of terrorism, whether to take them on or to talk to <coughs> them. And on India also, suddenly when India came to Pakistan for having a ceasefire on the LOC, and they came to us because of pressure from China after they had a conflict on the border in Galwan, in June 2020 yeah. right. and then they and we started became so excited that they'll start talking on Kashmir they had a very limited goal to prevent a two-front situation mm -hmm. I think on China our <coughs> relationship is rock-solid they need us we need them and I don't see major problems the problems are at our end bureaucratic red tape lack of security for Chinese personnel and projects and also what we promise we don't deliver and so lack so of how, capacity how, yeah. how should we proceed as far as India is concerned I think on India is concerned, I was the, uh, as you remember, the architect of track two with India yeah. in those days as a journalist. Because we have four neighbors. You can't wish neighbors away. But now I see, and I was minister in waiting to Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee as prime minister of BJP when he came in the Lahore bus yatra. Right. So, and I have great respect <coughs> for that statesman. But now I feel under Mr. Modi and RSS, India is following an ideological foreign policy. The mistake we made on Afghanistan uh, 20 years ago, Muslim bashing at home and Pakistan bashing abroad because that sells and that the Hindutva uh, mindset needs those votes in the uh, elections which are coming next But year. recently Jai Shankar, he was in Vienna mm. and he quipped that the West doesn't listen to us about <laughs> the epicenter of uh, terrorism. terrorism. <laughs> because it's become very boring, you see, yeah. with India being the epicenter of religious extremism. Right. When you but say that, Pakistan… Even that is not selling. Uh, no, that is selling. I think it's yeah. making a difference. I think for the first time, uh, you see uh, India uh, on the Economist. First time you see Chris in the Congress. I was seeing in the. I was recently in Washington, and there was Gregory Stanton, head of Genocide Watch, mm -hmm. and he said that uh, genocide is in the making on Muslims. I think for the first time, in the mainstream Western media and uh, parliamentarians, there is a critique of India which was never there before. But is it putting pressure on the government? No, it's not putting pressure on the U.S. government. On the Indian government. Uh, no, the Indian government is very strong. Modi has a 75 70 percent, yes. percent popularity. And then right now, at but he is dividing the Indian polity in a way which has never done because he's mm. burying Nehruvian secularism. So America, unfortunately for them, geopolitics trumps principles of human rights. And now we are entering into a you know, second wave of say Cold War. Yes, because of Cold the, War Two is already there, but mm. there's also another new development. We are back to the two camps which were there in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. China, Russia is one camp. Right. The West, NATO, US is another camp. What should we do? And I think we are very lucky. I think in my view, we have strategic space. Because we are also seeing a weakening of the West. US is no longer the sole superpower. Europe is divided. Europe isn't divided on uh, uh, China. But NATO has, uh, NATO has uh, got strength. And so the focus is going to be Southeast Asia, the so-called Indo-Pacific, which they say. But we, for example, for the first time in 25 years, India, Pakistan and China have a similar view on a global issue, okay. Ukraine. Yes. Ukraine yes. And also not just us, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, yeah. All important, UAE. Uh, you know, so I think countries. the Islam versus West divide Even is Israel. Being, yes, yes, is being replaced by the North-South divide.
So we have more strategic space. And I see the emergence of four Muslim middle powers, I call them. Pakistan, Iran, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, who are playing their we respective roles. We haven't discussed roles. Iran yet, because that's also yes, our You are ambassador yes. uh, with the yeah. with distinction in that. Country. Well, thank you very much. But right now, since Iran is under sanctions, we are under sanctions. Because we can't do, our banks are, you know, dollar-based. They cannot do normal business with Iran. And how do you see? Because gas pipeline agreement is there, despite American pressure. But it is, in fact, because of lack of investment, it is in limbo. I fear that I feel that on two countries, we have always had a problem. And a mindset is from Pakistani side, whether it's the military or the civilian side. One is Russia, one is Iran. There is a hesitation to move forward. We start, we talk of security, we talk of these things. I think there's no basic conflict of interest between Iran and Pakistan. If China can do this uh, normal trading with them, Russia can do that, even India. Uh, but sir, uh, with China, just uh, in, the, in the, during the thick of the Cold War, mm -hmm. we were their friends. No, I'm talking of vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, of course. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we could withstand the American pressure as far as uh, China. So I think that we are, we are go along. When India can build the Chaha Bahar port for them and have so much economic interaction, what's stopping us from at least starting off? We could start Correct. building. Yes. Correct. Correct. I think there's uh, uh, other issues. So a lot and I think some done. of the mindset in Islamabad I see is very West-oriented. They see Correct. the world through Washington, London, Brussels mm -hmm. or New York. And that yeah. worldview is not seen either from the eastern side. That and mindset continues. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we have now come to the end of our program and you have listened to the brilliant uh, discourse with Senator Mushahid Hussain. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, there are challenges, but there's also hope. Pakistan is not isolated. Pakistan has got a vibrant society, people are resilient and they can in fact withstand all challenges. As rightly put by Senator Mushahid Hussain, that after the dismemberment of, dismemberment of Pakistan in 71, we rose again. And then we said never again and we became a nuclear power. Like the Israelis said never again after the Holocaust. So we will uh, inshallah survive and uh, economic problems are uh, temporary. I remember that in 96, uh, the inflation rate in uh, Brazil was 1,500%. In Argentina, it was 2,000%. But they survived. And now they are a you know, thriving economy. So, but here, the big question is, we have to provide leadership. Our leadership has to give confidence to the people. And they can, in fact, lead the nation by example. So, keep, uh, we should keep our fingers crossed, inshallah. And thank you and keep watching our channel. Thank you so much.